Imagining what exoplanets are really like on the ground is a difficult thing, at least if you keep within the confines of hard science. We've gotten pictures of the surfaces of planets and moons in the solar system, such as Mars, Venus, and Titan, but those pictures tend to be of areas where, in the case of Mars, were chosen with keeping the safety of the rover in mind, or by landing by pure chance, as with Venus and Titan. You play it safe, or you go with the lottery odds both of which tend to place you in boring places. What we haven't done is visited the Grand Canyons or Mount Everests of those worlds, or looked at the truly alien vistas they might present. Look at the history of how envisioning alien worlds has been done in sci-fi. Arthur C. Clarke's The Lassa from the Songs of Distant Earth, an ocean world where 95% of the surface is covered in water or in a complete opposite grain, the alien landscapes imagined by Georges Méliès in the earliest science fiction films over a hundred years ago. As a science fiction author, this is a large part of what I do when I sit on my porch on warm summer nights, coming up with scripts for videos, questions for Event Horizon guests, and concepts for novels. But for me, it all predates that. Long before the internet revolution in the late 1980s, the days when 13-year-old me was wondering what alien worlds were really like, laying on a blanket looking at the rural Missouri stars before St. Louis' sky glow forever dimmed them, a time before we even knew for sure exoplanets even existed. Today we can get hints at what might be from our instrumentation, certain gases present in exoplanet atmospheres, or detecting worlds analogous to Jupiter and Saturn, some even with ring systems that outdo Saturn even planets so hot that it rains rock. But Earth-like exoplanets are actually the hardest to try to imagine, simply because they are so similar to Earth. They are the most interesting ones, to be sure, but it can be difficult to imagine because they would be so much like Earth, because that forces you to envision ever greater details on so little data. The term Earth-like world is tricky. You could make the case that both Venus and Mars are Earth-like, in that they are in or near the habitable zone of the sun. And Mars was certainly once a water world like Earth, and Venus very well may have been, and is very nearly the same size as Earth. Earth-like is common in our solar system, and our search for exoplanets seems to suggest that such worlds are common at large, such as the TRAPPIST-1 system shows. At least three Earth-like planets exist there in the habitable zone of that star, but that doesn't mean that they actually are Earths. That's an interesting thought though, and a major indicator that life may occur across the universe very commonly. It's amazing, just the notion that this star system alone produced three water worlds at various points in time that could have supported a biogenesis in life, but only one could support a sustained, long-term experiment of evolution, leading to complex life and subsequently long-term existence. It was our world, the blue jewel of the solar system so precious to everything we are. In addition to the blue jewel and the large terrestrial worlds, we face an even bigger prospect for at least simple life in the solar system. The probably dozens or more moons and even the minor planets of the outer solar system and even the large asteroid series that also could harbor subsurface liquid oceans or slush zones including Titan which might host an ocean kept liquid by the presence of ammonia acting as antifreeze. But what we don't have with all these worlds other than Earth is a very obvious, unambiguous signature saying that they have life. There are hints to be sure, but in contrast to Earth which screams its biosphere so loudly and has done so for so long that anyone in the Milky Way potentially knows about the Blue Jewel if they have the right technology, maybe they know exactly what to look for. Perhaps they have a blue jewel of their own. But we simply don't yet know the answer to whether subtle life in the solar system exists, alongside our very unambiguous Earth life. Do we share this star system with others, even microbial, but still neighbors? We simply don't know, nor do we know the extent of what the word others really means. In this video, I'm going to introduce a few new terms that have been floating around within astrobiology lately as we hammer out what that protoscience will really entail. That's if it ever truly exists. It still needs a subject to study. Earth life alone isn't enough. But the framework is being laid for a day when we do have something to study, be it an alien technosignature or a microbe from Mars. 
One of these terms is pre-panspermia. Obviously, panspermia is a subject I have covered many times on this channel. The transfer of life from one body in a star system to another. Or more broadly, the notion that maybe life from other star systems can infect each other by way of a meteorite, at least at the microbial level. Though you could also in principle include advanced alien civilizations colonizing other star systems into that mix. A starship to another world is a form of panspermia, as much as a microbe hitching a ride on a meteorite. But pre-panspermia may well precede the advent of life anywhere in the universe. It's the transfer of the building blocks of life, the movement of elements and compounds within star systems that allow for the chemistry of abiogenesis to occur on suitable worlds. This probably happened with Earth. When we look at the chemistry of the outer solar system, the comet-linked meteorites known as carbonaceous chondrites, we see the chemicals of life that may have first been delivered to the surface of the young Earth through impacts of these kinds of objects. When we look at the gigantic clouds of gas and dust present in the galaxy, we see the signatures of the same organic chemicals and materials, other than one perhaps. There does seem to be an absence of phosphorus in some areas of the galaxy, and it is crucial to life as we know it. But everything else is common and pervades the Milky Way galaxy to the point that we can probably safely suspect that pre-panspermia happens all over in most star systems with planets. That does not mean that life happens, but only that the materials that make up life move freely about the cosmos. You could even imagine a scenario where across the 4.6 billion year history of the Earth, an interstellar object, such as Comet Borisov, entered into the mix of Earth's biochemistry precursors through impact, and perhaps a few atoms within your body were generated by a completely different supernova from another part of the galaxy billions of years before the atoms that make up most of the matter in the solar system had been generated. Some small share of the matter making up our planet may have been interstellar in nature, and even prepanspermic. But here's the problem. We can again look at the terrestrial worlds of the solar system and really only Earth could hold on to broad habitability. Venus degraded into a hell world, where the only hypothetical habitability lies in its upper atmosphere, and Mars suffered from simply being too small, ultimately, to remain habitable. So we have a dichotomy. Three worlds that at various periods were habitable, suggesting that habitable terrestrial worlds are common in the universe at large but two of them did not stay habitable. This is an often overlooked problem. When pondering a subject like the rare earth hypothesis as a solution to the Fermi paradox, we tend to focus on things like a lack of plate tectonics, or a lack of a moon, or magnetic field. Yes, those are problems, but the challenges to abiogenesis may actually be far simpler than that. It may simply be that most exoplanets by and large have relatively short periods of habitability on their surfaces. But what's really actually rare is surface habitability that lasts billions of years, long enough to produce a civilization. That long period of habitability was extremely important for life on Earth. Life on Earth took nearly two billion years to even start what we consider to be complex life. That process is not understood well. And maybe if the situation had been different, it might have happened much faster. But it's also equally possible that it happened fast here on Earth, and that most worlds, four, five, or six billion years is needed for that leap. Well, that constrains just what kinds of stars can produce life. And if it is on the upper end, then the sun itself gets knocked out as a likely star to produce complex life, and very unlikely to ever produce a civilization. Life in that situation means we are an anomaly, and the real action happens most often around type M or K dwarf stars that live longer than the sun. But that doesn't speak to simple life. In contrast to complexity, simple life appeared on Earth at the very earliest moment it possibly could. In fact, it almost seems too early. There was life on this world, if the evidence we have of it is being interpreted correctly, at the end and during the late heavy bombardment when hails of asteroids and comets were hitting Earth. Life amid constant impacts, of which only one was needed to cause the demise of the dinosaurs long after. And it pays to remember, we're not even sure the earliest life on Earth, the simple microbes, were even native to this world. For all we know, it could have happened on Mars, and was transported here via panspermia, 
as Mars in the early days seems to have been a more hospitable place for abiogenesis to occur than Earth was. Yes, we could be Martians. But hidden in here may be a larger question. If situational worlds dictate abiogenesis and how far life can get, even among habitability, what about worlds we know probably exist but don't happen to have examples of in our solar system? What of worlds entirely covered in liquid water? Again, this is probably situational. I've mentioned completely water-covered ocean worlds before, as have others, and how it might be impossible for intelligence to arise on those worlds due to a lack of land. They would also lack the ability to smelt metals and build computers and rockets. But there are conceivable ways around that. We live on a planet that has coral, that in a way can build land. Though in that case, there is usually a seamount involved to form a base. Coral atolls represent life itself creating land, so it can be imagined such things might happen on water worlds, perhaps on a greater scale, or even life creating floating islands, or some surface otherwise, where some stepping stone to complex land life might get a foothold. It would be different from Earth, to be sure, but at least it can be envisioned. Unless there is a further problem, and a much more fundamental one. This one can be called the water paradox, and it's actually composed of two problems. The first is the question of how abiogenesis actually happened. If it happened around a hydrothermal vent in the ocean, or if it happened on land, and was linked to surface liquid water and volcanism. Recent work has shown that the latter might be more likely, and that has massive implications for the search for life in the universe, but more importantly, within our own solar system. The first part of the water paradox is whether it can happen in salt water at all. There is some indication that life on Earth may not have been able to arise in salt water. In fact, it may have required fresh water on land, only then to evolve the ability to colonize the oceans. If this turns out to be the case, then it has very serious implications for the potential for life in the rest of the solar system. In short, it's very likely going to eliminate Enceladus and Europa as potential abodes of life. Indeed, many of the potential ice shell moons. Though there is a chance that some of them are simply not salty, and the threshold of how much salt you can have in the water and still host the chemistry of abiogenesis is unknown. It's worth noting here that this aspect of the water paradox is not yet settled. But it could mean that if water worlds are the rule of the universe and that land is rare, then salt is a solution to the Fermi paradox. The universe being too salty and wet solution to the Fermi paradox aside, there is also another issue that thickens the plot, very seriously in fact. Recent findings in biochemistry suggest that the generation of RNA requires the presence of water, the right chemicals, all percolating through volcanic glasses, which were and are abundant on Earth, Mars, and probably Venus early in the history of the solar system when life first arose. This finding points squarely at the origin of life being on land. It also points to the formation of RNA being easy, and thus very likely to be common everywhere in the universe, a good sign for life, or at least the probable precursor of it. But then we come to a new finding. In a paper by Bruce Damer and David Deemer, link in the description below, and do check out next week's Event Horizon episode with Dr. Deemer, they report that another requirement for life may in fact be the presence of hot springs on land that go through cycles of drying out, that may be integral to the formation of protocells. In other words, if you have the right chemicals, many of which are found in meteorites, and a hot spring that flows and dries out periodically, something the authors actually verified happening in nature in the Kamchatka region of Russia, then you have the precursors of life. Given that hot springs are ultimately geothermal and volcanic activity making glasses can often be nearby, it's not hard to imagine a link to the basaltic glasses being present along with a hot spring, allowing for the circumstances of abiogenesis. While much of the process remains unclear, progress in understanding it is being made. Within this is also another concept, and another new term coined by Damer and Deemer, urability. The idea behind this concept is that, sure, you can have planets within the habitable zone of a star, but that doesn't guarantee that they can produce life. Rather, the conditions are situational, as they were here. As such, the solar system appears to have had two to three arable planets in its history. Again, Earth, Mars, and Venus. Regardless, if life arose on all three of them, Venus and Mars have lost their arability. Life could not arise on them now, 
if the hot springs hypothesis is correct. Even subsurface Mars that might still harbor microbial life can't produce an abiogenesis today due to a lack of dry and wet cycles, which is key to the hypothesis. So a planet may not simply need to be habitable, but it also must meet the conditions to be arable. And there may be factors here, such as changes to the atmosphere of a world, such as was Earth's great oxygenation event that actually means that Earth itself is no longer arable, despite hosting a huge biosphere that might just play into why we don't see evidence of multiple abiogenesis events on Earth. And indeed, we don't see it occurring all the time. It's not that the pre-existent life on Earth eats any new abiogenesis, rather it doesn't get that far, that it's the oxygen itself that poisons it instantly. It's an interesting thought indeed that life itself, which was responsible for the great oxygenation event, could actually render its own planet no longer arable, even though it's habitable and inhabited. But inside of all of this, there is something else. If it turns out that ice shell moons like Europa and Enceladus aren't places where life could arise, even with the presence of liquid water, there's one other body that comes onto the table. It once had as much water as Europa, and may still have subsurface water, and it's volcanic, and maybe still could have lava tubes and nooks and crannies where life might persist, protected by a shell of rock and it's among the last places we'd ever think to look for microbial life. But in this model, it potentially ticks the boxes. To paraphrase 2010, all these worlds are yours, except Io. Attempt no landing there. Thanks for listening. I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently confident in the salt. Imagine a land world that has water but not salty oceans, just freshwater percolating around that spawns an invasion fleet. They show up and we say, accept this earth delicacy as a token of our acceptance of our new alien overlords. We call it a jar of pickles. And boom, invasion over. We got this. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.